Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you had a good lunch, and uh, I'm pleased to welcome you back to our afternoon session, where we are going to be a little bit more technical about the projects, explaining you a little bit more about what we have been working on. And um, we are going to be uh, starting uh, this afternoon session with the LOTCOM um, project session, where um, we are going to hear um, two presentations from Simon um, <clears throat> Geiger and Antonino Arico. Um, it's going to start, um, Simon is going to start his presentation. Simon um, has received his PhD in 2017 from the Ruhr University Bochum, working at the Max Planck Institute of, um, for Iron Research in Düsseldorf on stability of iridium-based catalyst for electrochemical water splitting. He joined the DLR in 2019 as postdoc on catalyst development for electrochemical CO2 reduction with the EU project Lottecom. He was awarded with a further prize for excellent research works by the GDCH, so this is the Gesellschaft Deutscher Chemiker, in uh, 2018 and has, uh, has published 30 peer-reviewed uh, publications in the field of electrocatalysts, oxygen evolution, electrolysis, fuel cells, and electrochemical CO2 reduction. His presentation is going to be about the catalyst development towards efficient CO2 reduction. With this, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Simon Geiger. Simon. Yeah, thank you, Schwan, for this personal introduction, uh, which allows me to directly uh, switch to the technical part and the topic of this first technical uh, session, uh, which will be on catalyst development um, for efficient CO2 reduction within the project LOTOCOM, uh, so low temperature electrochemical reduction of CO2 to methanol, which was also introduced already by Schwan this morning. So on slide two, you will see the short agenda for this next 20 minutes where I want to um, introduce anyhow a bit the topic of catalysts and CO2 reduction and then show you our experimental setups and focus on electrode and also on catalyst development. On slide three, as I mentioned, a uh, short introduction has already been given by Schwan, but still always in important to motivate the topic and so why do we do CO2 reduction? Uh, CO2 as a greenhouse gas needs to be reduced um, regarding the climate change, this is known, but it's also important to mention that 90% uh, of our daily life products are still based on fossil fuels and we need a replacement here and CO2 can act here as a carbon source that is basically uh, good for climate. So why electrochemical CO2 reduction. We also have classical CO2 reduction in chemistry, but the electrochemical way would allow us to directly couple solar and wind energy and also allow us to use this in a, in a single step and basically lower our capex because we don't have a lot of equipment and several reactors necessary. And we operate here at quite mild uh, temperature and pressures, which will also lower the OPEX. So these are the advantages of using electrochemical process. On the right side, you can see then the goal of this carbon neutral cycle by capturing CO2, electrochemical converting it to methanol, and then use this as a source for daily life products and also fuel, obviously. On slide four, on the left side, you can see target products that we can achieve with CO2 reduction electrochemically, and they are plotted and uh, with a normal market price worth it, the annual global production. And you can see, for instance, formic acid, quite expensive product. However, we don't need a lot of it and methane vice versa. So probably the ones in the middle, CO, ethylene, methanol and ethanol are quite good candidates for our uh, target. And on the right side, you can see different elements that are capable or you basically investigated for CO2 reduction. And interestingly, it's only copper that is capable of reducing CO2 to hydrocarbons, which are one of the most interesting products because ethanol, uh, ethylene, ethanol, methanol, these are all hydrocarbons. Um, some elements like zinc, gold, and silver are capable of reducing it to carbon monoxide. And some uh, here shown in yellow, uh, reduce it to formate, but the majority of our metals used as catalysts are just hydrogen evolution catalysts and they don't have any specific properties to reduce it. Um, so on slide five, 
There's also a small introduction to Catalyst in general. Why do we use it for maybe less specific audience? Anyhow, it's interesting. On the light, left side, you can see an energy diagram and a reaction progress. On the left side, the CO2 that we want to transfer onto a product. This has a higher energy level, ethylene in this case, so we need to invest some energy. There's no workaround. We need to uh, have this energy inside, and this is usually the energy that would come from the sun. But there's also the big uh, hill in between that we call activation energy. And this can be significantly reduced if a catalyst is used. And this is why 90% or even more of all processes in chemistry are basically um, operated with the help of a catalyst. And the catalyst in itself is just acting in a way, on the right side you can see that several steps are occurring in this reaction progress from CO2 to ethylene or other products. And it basically changes the binding energy between the molecule that adheres, for instance CO2, and the catalyst itself. And by, by these electronic properties of the material, we can specifically engineer in principle how, uh, how strong or how weak it's binded and also which kind of product in the end will come out. So this is in the end the job of, of chemists and uh, electrochemical engineering to, to modify the catalytic properties. On slide six, there's again an introduction of the project Lauter.com that has been already introduced in the morning, so I think I will not go into detail. There have been several parts that were investigated, and in this talk I want to uh, just focus on this selective CO2 reduction material that is within the TLR3 uh, part. On slide seven, there's the experimental setups. Uh, I think also Schwann has used this uh, uh, diagram in the in the morning, but it's anyhow I think important to mention again that there is a um, transfer from a rather fundamental approach on the left side, where we have to put CO2 in a solution and just have a metal surface as a, as an electrode towards an uh, electrode where we have, for instance, already a gas diffusion electrode where CO2 can come from the back side. Uh, so uh, avoids us to have um, allows us to have much better mass transport of CO2 to the catalyst, and then also on the very right side to change the aqueous electrolyte by a, a polymer electrolyte, um, basically lowering the resistance of the cell, and it would be similar to the known fuel cell configuration in this case. And slide eight, there's the schematics how these cells look like in our lab. On the left side, there's the so-called H cell, where just the metal is typed in a solution where CO2 is bubbled in, and then in the middle the flow-through cell, where we have two electrolyte pumps that pumps the catalyte and the analyte, vice versa, that are separated by membrane, and then uh, CO2 comes from the back side of the electrode. And on the right side, this is very similar to a fuel cell setup where just the membrane is, is basically separating the two compartments. Just in this case, we also have water uh, present, uh, basically similar like an electrolyzer setup, yes, not a fuel cell. On slide nine, we come now to catalysts. So with respect to CO2 to methanol, which was the initial goal of this project, we had a look at the literature and checked uh, different uh, publications and chose two that we would like to uh, focus on. On the left side, there's a paper of Huang where they used the cobalt uh, material that looks like these urchins that was capable of producing CO2 to uh, methanol about 98% Faraday efficiency. So Faraday efficiency means 98% of all current that you put in would result in the product methanol which is quite high in this case, but there are rather low current densities used here. So we would reproduce this result and then scale this up to higher current densities in principle. On the right side, you can see a more decent Faraday efficiency of 30 to 30% percent presented by this copper oxide material by Albo, Spanish group. And this was the second goal to also reproduce this. So starting with the left one on slide 10, we can see then the uh, results that we have. 
carried out on the left side the results of DLR, on the right side in comparison to literature. And we basically reproduced the synthesis procedure and also got this urchin-like um, nanoparticles. And by looking at XRD peaks, the correctest peak were also there. And also for the XPS, we got similar results. The only difference maybe going into more detail is that we had some lattice oxygen present for the paper and which we could not really recover. But looking at the structure, it's also questionable if there is any lattice oxygen within. Probably this would lead to too far here. Going to slide 11, there's the comparison of the electrochemical characterization. So here you can see a cyclovoltamogram is basically you sweep the current from a lower potential to a higher potential and back and then you record the current which is shown here. So with black there is no real process uh, noticeable because only nitrogen is used and in case CO2 is used one can see here in red uh, significantly uh, some reduction progress in both cases. The only difference and maybe important difference is that this was a irreversible process in our case. So um, this was only happening once and why uh, in the second sweep there was no reductive process anymore, which leads us to the uh, assumption that there is some blockage of acticides. This could be recovered in case one goes to a very oxidative environment, like shown here on the right side with this oxidative peak then the reductive peak would come again. But this was not discussed and shown in the paper. But could be the reason for this result that is shown in, on page 12 now, a comparison of the uh, uh, analytics on the left side, also pictures of the SEM after our process, which are quite similar to the uh, respective paper but the only product we detected was hydrogen and also our analysis could not detect any methanol in comparison to the very high amount of methanol in the paper. This was quite surprising, but therefore we could not figure out the difference and we could also not continue with this product, obviously. So slide 13 just shows this um, overview again and showing that we are now focusing on the copper material on the right side um, which was presented several times to be able to produce methanol on slide 14 there is now the comparison of our results on the left side in comparison to on the right side the paper and again we really cared about all the detail and the identical parameters and also get into contact with this group actually to solve uh, the problem that we had no methanol in this case. So on the left side, you can see at 10 milliampere per square centimeter, our main product is carbon monoxide and some ethylene and more hydrogen, while the paper showed here 40% methanol, even though we used basically the same material. Um, but interestingly, going to higher current densities that you can see also on the left graph at 100 milliampere per square centimeter, we had significant amount of ethylene and also 20% of ethanol and some methane, which was quite um, good in principle in comparison to this paper where at 40 milliampere per square centimeter, the, the amount of carbonaceous fuels uh, was decreasing significantly. And since we want higher current density, this was the... Uh, the initiative to change our goals now, this you can see on slide 15. Um, so we changed the, the project goal within an amendment to carbonaceous fuel and from then on would now focus more on ethylene and ethanol, which are as well valuable products and we could actually produce these. On slide 16, you can see then the two main catalytic materials, uh, commercially available that we used and compare these also with respect to the product um, distribution and interestingly we can see that this material across that shows this octahedral um, species was uh, producing more methane in comparison to the US nano material and since we don't want to have so much um, um, uh, afterwards process products it's maybe more beneficial to have less diverse products and then we chose now to use us nano as our catalyst 
um, on slide 17. This was also shown by Schwan this morning briefly. We synthesized ourselves different shapes because we thought, okay, we saw this shape have some influence since the octahedra produced some methane before, and we produced a bunch of different shapes and compared the Faraday efficiency. However, one would need to say that within the arrow bar, the sh shape was not that decisive, and also the product did not significantly different from the commercial one. So we are still working now with the commercial product because we have this in large scale available. And the reason for the, this, let's say, um, very similar result is that the morphology afterwards changes significantly to during the CO2 reduction process. This you can see on slide 18. On the left side, there is uh, the, this across catalyst with the octahedra before and afterwards you can see that there are some dendrites formed and the surface has significantly changed. So no matter with what kind of shape you start at the beginning, it will change. And this is a general problem of the whole catalytic society, let's say, for the CO2 reduction that whatever you like with and, and you tailor really your product, uh, your catalyst, it will not uh, survive through CO2 reduction. So this brings me to the last part with electrodes. Uh, we have here on slide 19, shown on the left side, an overview of what is really necessary to produce successful electrodes. And this is the so-called triple phase boundary that is very important here. Meaning three phases have to be present on the catalyst at the same time. So the first one is that electrons need to be transferred to the catalyst, which is shown here in orange by the gas diffusion electrodes, usually an electronical um, conductive material like carbon. But at the same time, it needs to be also porous that gas, our CO2 gas can reach the catalyst as well. So usually they have some, some porous structure here. And then we also need to have an ionic conductivity. So usually H plus needs to reach the catalyst or in this case, OH minus needs to leave the catalyst. So we have this mass balance or uh, 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 allowed for the mass balance. And a problem here is, for instance, if one of these phases are dominant, for instance, water comes here and um, floods the catalysts, this will be a problem and we have less performance. So triple phase boundary is one of the key uh, performance indicators uh, have a successful electrode. And we fabricate this on the right side by airbrushing our catalytic material within some um, nafion uh, resin and also isopropanol to dilute on a commercial available gas diffusion layer that has already some uh, advantage properties for us like hydrophobicity for instance to generate this triple phase boundary. And then on slide 20 uh, this is just to indicate that the results I would now show are basically performed in a zero gap cell and on slide 21, we can see then the first results on the zero gap cell. We needed to transfer them, the results that we got in this flow through cell to this cell, which was at the beginning difficult, but then we succeeded also this. And on the left side, you can see our small test protocol of 60 minutes at 100 milliampere per square centimeter to characterize different electrode that have been manufactured. And this has been done now together with IRD who are responsible within the project for large scale production of the electrodes. And the first result that we show here is that electrode preparation matters because similar catalyst or identical catalyst leads to different uh, results. Like here, the right bar produced by IRD showed in the beginning quite high hydrogen evolution reaction. And we needed to first solve this by exchange in the recipe and really care about details. And then in the following results on um, slide 22, for instance, uh, I just want to show uh, a few interesting ones was, for instance, changing the nafion content in the layer that decreased here, the ethylene content. So it's maybe not beneficial to use high nafion contents. On the other way, we changed uh, the nafion ionomer by an anion exchange ionomer. In this case, we figured out that this is also not beneficial probably because nafion has this hydrophobic um, uh, backbone that is beneficial for the for the triple phase boundary. And on slide 23, there are three more interesting findings just in a kind of summary on the left side. You can see that 
uh, current density or the, the potential that is coming within along with current density change is responsible for different product distribution. For instance, at 100 million per square centimeter, we have quite high ethylene, which we don't have at lower current densities. Now, here would be, of course, interesting to also now go to higher current densities to see how is the performance um, here. And in the middle, you can see a change, for instance, of the CO2 flow rate at rather high flow rate in the beginning of 180, changing to 18 normal milliliter per minute. We see that this affects the CO2 production, for instance. So CO2 goes down while methane goes up, which can be explained that CO is the first step of the reaction. And if you have a quite high CO2 um, mass flow, this would lead to CO2 leaving the surface fast and no chance of CO2 to further react, uh, of CO to further react. And on the right side, we see that also an intermittent shutdown is quite uh, critical for the cell performance. So in this case, we uh, just let the cell uh, stand over the weekend when we see afterwards that the performance from a normal operative at like 30% hydrogen and carbonaceous fuels, we come to a, a Soleil hydrogen evolution um, cell. So with this on slide 24, it's the last result of the commercial uh, copyright material that we have now at the moment. Cell operated at 2.5 volt and at like 30% ethylene production. And brings me to the summary um, at slide 25. The summary of the catalysts would be that we have still contradictory reports and some issues with reproducibility. We know that the catalyst affects somehow the selectivity, but we also are aware that the morphology changed during operation. So there needs to be some more investigation. And for the electrodes on slide 26, the summary would be that we have a significant amount of parameters that influence the performance that we all need to care about. And a bunch of them we have analyzed already. And our best performance in the zero gap configuration so far is, is written here with 30% ethylene and 20% CO. And this was also the result that is now based for the Lodocom demonstrator that has been already mentioned on slide 27. A short outlook is shown. Um, basically towards the Lottercom and also the eco to fuel project based on these results. And still we need to further stabilize and improve the selectivity, but this can also be done now based on a, let's say, feedback loop based on the results that are coming in the next weeks uh, of our two kilowatt demonstrator. With this, uh, I want to thank uh, the whole consortium and you for, for listening with slide 28, just showing the consortium and the Lodocom project. Thank you, Simon, for this presentation. Uh, and I'm sure that there are um, some uh, questions already coming in. Um, questions uh, for Simon um, will be answered uh, later on in the Q&A session after um, um, Dr. Uh, Antonino Salvatore Arico's presentation, who is following now. So Dr. Antonino um, Salvatore Arico is Director of the Institute of Advanced Energy Technologies, CNR Italy, of the Italian National Council of Research. His current interests are dealing with material science and energy technologies, in particular fuel cells, electrolysis, catalysis, batteries, solar cells, and electrochemistry. He is author of more than 350 peer-reviewed publications in international journals, nine patents, and 10 book chapters. He has received more than 20,000 citations in uh, scientific journals. Um, Dr. Areco has been coordinator and responsible scientifically for more than 40 EU international and national projects and industry-funded contracts. He will be um, giving a presentation about, about the development of anode electrocatalyst for low temperature co-electrolysis of CO2 and water. Dr. Areco, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Shuan, for your kind introduction. Uh, it is uh, uh, my great pleasure to be present today in this uh, interesting meeting. And uh, uh, my presentation of today is dealing with uh, uh, the oxygen evolution process 
in uh, um, a system that is dedicated to low temperature co-electrolysis of carbon, di carbon dioxide and water. Uh, next slide, please, slide number two. So oh, the uh, outline of this presentation is uh, essentially regarding the oxygen evolution process, but uh, in a context where we have also carbon dioxide reduction. And uh, our analysis is uh, essentially regarding the zero, uh, the screening of the electrocatalysts in a zero gap cell uh, based on uh, perforosulfonic acid membrane or an ion exchange membrane as electrolyte separator. So the aim is uh, to uh, understand the electrochemical performance, the electrochemical behavior for the oxygen evolution uh, in these two different uh, environments in order to, to, to um, uh, uh, get information on the energy efficiency and also uh, uh, clearly understand which is the advantage of the alkaline versus the acidic environment and vice versa. Uh, slide number three, three please. Okay, uh, now regarding the uh, 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 reaction process, we can clearly see that uh, in the uh, anion uh, uh, environment, uh, anion exchange membrane environment, uh, of course, uh, we can get advantage of a larger carbon dioxide solubility at the interface between the electrode and the electrolyte. And uh, of course, we need the presence of uh, hydroxyl ions at the anode for the oxygen evolution reaction. This is uh, really important that uh, for this reason, we recirculate uh, hydroxyl ions, uh, we recirculate the KOH solution, diluted KOH solution at the anode. Uh, in the protonic environment, we have a, a por perforosulfonic membrane separator. And since the environment is acidic, we need to use essentially precious metal electrocatalysts at the anode due to the high operating potential and the needed uh, electrochemical stability. So essentially, iridium or ruthenium oxide. Uh, in this case, uh, we have uh, water that is oxidized to oxygen uh, at, the, at the anode. And in this case, we recirculate just uh, pure water at the anode. So two different strategies, two different operating approaches for the uh, uh, alkaline and the acidic environments. Uh, slide number four, please. So uh, we have, uh, in the first phase of the LOTER CO2M project, we have screened a significant, a large number of catalyst formulations, essentially precious metal electrocatalysts at the, uh, uh, in the acidic environment and non-precious metal electrocatalysts in the anionic, in the alkaline environment. And of course, uh, we have prepared these catalysts with different morphologies. Some catalysts require high temperature treatment. So you can see some sintering degree, but other catalysts can be prepared in a really uh, dispersed form. Of course, we have achieved a variety of crystallized sites, in general, lower than 20 or 10 nanometers, and the BT surface area is above 100 square meter per gram. Uh, slide number five, please. So uh, uh, in slide number five, we can really see that at low uh, operating potentials at 1.5 volts, that is just above the, the thermoneutral potential for the, the, you know, for the water splitting, uh, usually we, we get uh, interesting mass activities, something like 100 ampere per gram already with non-precious metal electrocatalysts. However, we also see that the best performance is achieved in the protonic environment using iridium ruthenium oxide, oxygen evolution electrocatalysis. Uh, slide number six, please. So uh, in this table, uh, we can see at 1.8 volts versus the reversible hydrogen electrode that we have a mass activity for iridium, iridium ruthenium oxide exceeding 1,000 uh, uh, ampere per gram. In the case of the non-precious metal electrocatalysis in the anionic environment, we get something like 
200, 400 uh, uh, amperes per, per, per gram. But we have essentially very good stability for the anode electrocatalyst using some uh, uh, um, uh, nickel manganese, nickel iron oxide with uh, spinel structure. Uh, num slide number seven, please. So uh, in this slide, we can see that the nickel iron oxide is uh, uh, performing better than the nickel manganese oxide. That means that this uh, catalyst is uh, at the present the, the, the benchmark uh, catalyst for the oxygen evolution reaction in the alkaline environment in the presence of a, an ion exchange membrane. And we generally use a, a, a catalyst loading in the range of Q, 2.5 milligrams per square centimeter. So uh, uh, th there is no significant uh, uh, content of the uh, uh, catalyst used uh, 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 in, the, in this electrochemical device. Slide number eight, please. So in the eco, uh, eco uh, um, Q fuel project, that is, of course, uh, the uh, scaling up activity, dealing with the scaling up activity carried out in the Lotter CO2M project and dealing with, uh, as uh, discussed by Schwann this morning, and dealing with uh, uh, aiming to demonstrate a one megawatt system. We have moved to an advanced catalyst formulation uh, that is essentially based on the nickel hydroxide hydrate structure, essentially a rhomboidal structure uh, showing uh, excellent characteristics. As you can see, uh, excellent dispersion of the uh, uh, particles, uh, small particles lower than 10 nanometers. And uh, uh, as you can see also from the X-ray diffraction, you have a significant broadening of the reflections. And this is a clear indication on a statistics basic, uh, basis that we have small particle size. And from the XPS analysis, we can see uh, various uh, uh, um, oxidation states and this redox process, uh, this redox behavior can help the oxygen evolution reaction. Slide number nine, please. So uh, um, uh, now regarding the uh, 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 oxygen evolution reaction in a practical device in a zero gap cell using a platinum at the cathode as a, uh, uh, counter and reference electrode, we can achieve at one ampere square centimeter, 1.8 or 1.7 volts in the 1.8 in the raw curve, 1.7 volts in the higher free curve uh, that will correspond to a, a voltage efficiency for the anode much better than 80%. This means uh, that the anode oxygen evolution process is not the rate determining step in this overall process of co-electrolysis co of carbon dioxide and water, as we will see later. And we have achieved mass activity exceeding 400 amperes per gram at 1.7 volts using these improved anode electrocatalysts. And these results have been achieved in a practical single cell of 100 square centimeter. Um, and uh, uh, now moving to the uh, slide number 10, uh, I can, uh, we can get some information, some more detailed information about the overpotential at the anode uh, after some, uh, let's say, using a reference electrode and after some correction for the uh, higher drop uh, and the thermoneutral potential, we can see that at one ampere square centimeter, we have 140 millivolts of overpotential. And at tuffle slope of 117, 16 millivolts per decade, that is corresponding to one electron transfer process as a rate determining step for the oxygen evolution reaction. And uh, it, is, it is pointed out that this is achieved at the practical current densities. Slide number 11, please. So uh, in this slide, we can uh, see some durability test using this uh, nickel iron uh, hydroxide hydrate, 1,000 hours at one ampere square centimeter. 
and we have a, a, a cell voltage of 1.8 to 1.85, and also some small decrease of cell voltage over time. That means an increase of voltage efficiency. And if you compare the polarization curves, beginning of life and end of life, we have essentially the same results. So this is extremely stable electrocatalyst, highly performing, but also uh, characterized by excellent stability. Slide number 12, please. And the XPS analysis of the, uh, of the ion catalyst after 1,000 hours operation shows that essentially we have the same electronic structure, but we can clearly see the potassium uptake on the surface, the presence of the uptake of potassium hydroxide. During operation, we have an uptake of uh, uh, hydroxide of hydroxyl ions on the surface of this catalyst that is good wetting properties and that are essentially for the oxygen evolution reaction in this system. And uh, uh, a detailed analysis of the uh, 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 nickel QP and FQP orbitals uh, can clearly indicate that, that upon operation, the red curve, we have a small shift to higher binding energies and the presence of some additional peak that is reflecting the presence of higher oxidation states due to the operation at high uh, uh, potentials. Uh, slide number 12, please, uh, 13, please, slide number 13, please. So uh, we can also see that we have a good, uh, let's say, uh, we have a small particle size uh, after uh, uh, 1,000 hours operation. This is uh, in slide number 13. And of course, uh, there is uh, some uh, gluing effect by the ionomer, but still the particle size is uh, sufficiently small. And now we can move to slide number 14. And uh, here in slide number 14, we can uh, have a comparison of the uh, performance of the electrocatalysts for the oxygen evolution reaction in the protonic environment and the anionic environment. You can still see that uh, even if we have reduced the 10 times the catalyst loading at the anode, in the case of the PEM uh, electrolysis cell, uh, using iridium rutinium oxide, the precious metal electrocatalyst, we have still twice current density at 1.8 volts operating cell voltage. And, uh, and of course, there is a difference of one order of magnitude in catalyst loading but uh, the current density is much better in the case of the precious metal electrocatalysis in the protonic environment. However, we can compensate a little bit by increasing the catalyst loading in the case of the nickel iron oxide electrocatalyst and the performance is still sufficient to get high current density because we have something like one ampere square centimeter at 1.8 volts and 400 ampere per gram uh, mass activity. You can see from the SE impedance spectra that the main difference between the protonic uh, uh, environment based on the uh, precious metal electrocatalyst and the acidic environment is essentially a, a significant larger polarization resistance for the non-precious metal electrocatalyst. So, uh, we can move to slide number 15. Here is shown the setup that we use for, for the co-electrolysis of carbon dioxide and water. We have, uh, we have uh, uh, we condense the reaction products at the cathode in order to focus on the, to understand the production of carbonaceous liquid fuels. Uh, of course, we also analyze the gas phase, but our aim is essentially addressing in the, in the, in the essentially in the eco to fuel project on the production of liquid fuels. And uh, if we can move to slide number uh, 16, in the presence of carbon dioxide and cuprite uh, electrocatalyst at the cathode, we can see that of course, there is a significant decrease of current density. We have something like uh, 
300 million per square centimeter uh, 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 at two volts at the beginning of a test, but after a, a prolonged operation, it is uh, decreases a little bit, uh, and also you have, you can see a change in the profile because uh, the, the hydrogen evolution reaction uh, is uh, is of course uh, uh, becoming more important while the electrode is uh, folded. And that this was also discussed by Simon in the previous presentation, but I want to emphasize in slide number 17, please, uh, um, uh, that uh, when we operate the cell under voltage control, at, uh, let's say at a constant voltage efficiency of 1.8 volts, this is the overall cell voltage, cathode plus, cathode plus anode and membrane, of course, we have a decrease of current density with time due to the, let's say, absorption of CO2, the poisoning blockage effect by CO2 on the catalytic sites. But if you move to 2.2 volts, we start with 200 milliampere square centimeter, and uh, during operation, we can achieve 600 milliampere square centimeter. Of course, we are happy of this high current density, but uh, unfortunately, this does not correspond entirely uh, to organic products, because uh, you can see on the right uh, uh, plot that uh, the, mm, mm, there is no proportional increase of the uh, uh, carbonaceous products by increasing the current density by operating at a higher voltage corresponding to higher current densities. And uh, of course, uh, the large increase of current density is essentially related to the flooding of the electrode and the uh, increase of the hydrogen evolution reaction. So main products that uh, main liquid products achieved in these tests are essentially methylformate, ethanol, and propanol. Uh, but still, most of the products are essentially related to the gaseous products uh, uh, essentially hydrogen evolution. Slide number 18, please. We have estimated uh, uh, quantitatively the uh, 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 carbon dioxide uh, conversion into liquid carbonaceous products corresponding to 240 micromoles per gram uh, per hour. And these, of course, need to be significantly enhanced uh, uh, by, by improving uh, electrode and catalyst structure at the cathode. However, I want to, moving to slide number uh, 19, that uh, is dealing with the conclusions, I will say that uh, uh, we have developed uh, uh, and, uh, and characterized the different uh, anode electrocatalysts for the oxygen evolution reaction. And we have observed that, that there are several promising formulations based on spinel structure, nickel manganese, nickel iron, but also the nickel iron hydroxide hydrate with rhomboedral structure. This is in slide number 19, please. And, um, uh, um, and of course, we can have an enhanced reaction rate using these, uh, 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 let's say, advanced uh, catalyst formulation with the 10 nanometer particle size and good dispersion. With this formulation, we can achieve 400 amperes per gram at 1.8 volts versus the reversible hydrogen electrode. Uh, this is the raw performance, not uh, corrected by iron drop. That means uh, uh, this is uh, uh, appropriate to achieve high current density. Of course, uh, it is not comparable to what we have in PEM electrolysis with the reading routine oxide, but I think uh, uh, this is a, a, a good result. And of course, we can spend more, more energy on the cathode reaction, on the CO2 reaction in order to achieve practical current densities at suitable voltage efficiency. Slide number 10, uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank the uh, um, financial support from the European Commission. Uh, this is uh, uh, slide number uh, 20, sorry. Uh, and I uh, uh, would like to thank all of you for your kind attention. Thank you, Antonino. Thank you, Simon, for the insights in the catalyst world for the CO2 reduction. We have received <laughs> some questions already. And um, 
some of them are multiple questions. So if um, if you have sent your questions and we are not going to be discussing your questions in this session, please send us uh, your you email contact and we will be contacting you back. But uh, there is a question, um, for example, from uh, Mr. Bassetto uh, from the RD department from Breton uh, SPA, um, an Italian, uh, it big Italian company, who is asking about innovative way to reduce the CO2 emissions from the kilns that are fed with methane. Um, of course, you can always have the methane that um, um, we are, for example, producing with the Lottercom technology. Uh, but he's uh, he's asking about inno inno innovative ways and uh, ideas. So this question goes uh, out to Antonino and to Simon. Can you think about anything, um, or shall we go back to Mr. Bassetto later on uh, with uh, a more uh, deep discussion? Uh, thank you, Shuan. I don't know if uh, Simon wants uh, to, to to be first in answering, or I can can I can I go ahead? You can, yes, yeah, if you want. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I I, I will say, oh, oh, of course, uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, low temperature co-electrolysis of carbon dioxide and water is uh, strongly affected by the uh, slow reaction rate at the cathode because CO two is a quite stable molecule. Uh, uh, quite stable molecule at low temperature. Uh, of course, uh, at the high temperature in solid oxide electrolysis, uh, you can get uh, carbon, you can get the syn gas uh, at the practical carbon density, and after a downstream conversion uh, methanation process, you can get methane, and methane can be fed into natural gas grid or used for any other application. However, our efforts are addressing it to achieving. Uh, liquid fuels characterized by high energy density. And for that reason, we have to work at low operating temperatures. And uh, uh, of course, copper oxide, copper electrocatalysts are uh, at the moment, it seems to be the, better ch the best choice for this application. We are essentially uh, uh, focusing on the electrostructure, as al also mentioned by Simon, the electrostructure beside the catalyst plays a relevant role. So the electrostructure can really provide a step change in the future to enhance the carbon dioxide reduction in low temperature co-electrolysis. Thank you, Antonino. Um, Mr. Rodrigo Paris uh, um, is asking, uh, he's from Spain, he's asking, what is what is limiting you to raise the current density? And I believe this question can be also answered by both of you. So I can go if you want, Antonino. <laughs> please, 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 Simon. So uh, as we mentioned that uh, for the triple phase boundary, so for instance, several aspects have to be guaranteed. And if you increase the current density significantly, at some point you will just not be able to transfer CO2 at significant uh, at necessary amount to the electrode and this is one of the main reasons why we are still operating at rather low current densities in comparison to for instance electrolysis that are operative at like amps per square centimeter or even more where you have water as as your adduct or your reactant that is more easy to be transferred to the to the electrode Thank you, Yezimon. Um, another question, which are actually multiple questions, uh, from Mr. Vivi Kanatan from Essen. So he asked, uh, how about the morphology of the catalyst? Did you try 3D structures? I'm going to re read all the questions, and then you can answer it. Uh, did you only try to stabilize the catalyst with enough iron, or did you consider also other materials? So I, so I guess this goes for the for the CO2 reduction catalysts, right? I believe so. Um, so yeah, in this project so far, we only stabilized with uh, additives like PTFE, for instance, or, or nafion ionomer, but obviously it did not really stabilize uh, the catalyst itself by its surface. It's more reverse, it's more responsible for stabilizing the whole electrode structure, meaning of a, of a mechanical. Uh, degradation that we can avoid by this. 
but if you uh, now address this morphology change that we have shown, uh, there's some other activities that are going on where we try to, let's say, encapsulate uh, the material or the catalyst inside of pores in order to avoid its degradation uh, or also other uh, additives that could help for, for, this, uh, for this degradation process, yes. So there are activities going on. Uh, can I add a comment from my side yeah. as well? Uh, I, I think also we needed to stabilize the oxidation state of the copper. The cuprite is one plus oxidation state. We have made in the Lotter CO2 M project some attempts using zinc to stabilize the copper oxidation state. And zinc copper oxide is well known for the methanol synthesis process. However, the productivity of carbon dioxide has not increased. So, of course, we needed to stabilize the morphology. We needed to stabilize also the, the, the uh, uh, electronic uh, uh, structure of the uh, cathode catalyst. Thank you, Antonino. So we have uh, still 10 minutes left, and there is, a, there is a rather tricky question now coming in, and I believe this is um, towards Antonino. Um, do you think that the nickel is going to be an issue or critical uh, critical material for the future? And are there any ideas on replacing nickel if this is going to be the case? <laughs> Thank you for this question. Yeah, this is a really an important question because uh, we, uh, you know, uh, nickel was uh, is not uh, included at the moment uh, in the critical raw materials list of the European Commission for 2020, but in the future could be included. That and this is a really a big drawback for uh, alkaline systems because, uh, in, including uh, uh, alkaline electrolysis, this is essentially based on nickel. We use nickel for the catalysts. Uh, we use nickel for the um, plates, for the bipolar plates, essentially for the coating. Of course, uh, we can manage uh, using iron let's say, uh, because we can use steel coated with nickel for the uh, uh, bipolar plates. We can use essentially iron uh, electrocatalysts, but uh, there are not many choices. If, uh, if nickel will be included in the critical raw materials list, it will be very difficult to find alternatives. Of course, I understand that, that political situation uh, is very complicated at the moment, and I hope that uh, in the future the situation will be much better and uh, we can more assess uh, to these materials. But the nickel is uh, at the moment an important element for alkaline electrolysis and co-electrolysis, and, uh, and uh, replacement could be iron and steel for the plates, but uh, uh, of course, there is always a replacement, but this will decrease the uh, uh, energy efficiency, of course, for sure, and uh, possibly also the stability. Thank you, Antonino. So we have still seven minutes, uh, and there goes another question, and I believe this is uh, towards Simon. Simon, do you know uh, why the catalysts change their morphology? So, as Antonino mentioned, um, we have uh, oxide material, copper oxide, that is present here. And during this reductive operation, we have uh, a reduction of this oxide to metallic copper, usually. And this can be avoided, obviously, by adding some, some, some elements or trying to, to avoid this. But it's still happening in our case. And during this, redu uh, during this reduction process, it's also... Uh, some copper uh, atoms will dissolve into the solution and then redeposit again, uh, probably to this metallic dendrite structure that I have shown there. So it's basically a, a dissolution redeposition process and that is occurring here. And interestingly, maybe to mention also here is that even though you would say now then we can start with a metallic copper and we would not have this, but also um, there have been several papers that have shown that also a metallic copper material uh, would also change its morphology and this is more or less something to do with with uh, surface energies on the electrode that cause these atoms to be mobile under these conditions and uh, organized in a different way. 
Thank, thank you, Simon. And uh, just right now, while you were talking about metallic copper nanoparticles, another question came in uh, from Frederick Sondergaard Peterson from Denmark. He thanks Simon for the interesting presentation and asked whether he looked at metallic copper nanoparticles. Uh, so maybe uh, you uh, you can give uh, give a more detailed uh, explanation on that. Um, yes, somehow in the beginning uh, we we focused more on oxides because they have been shown to be more active towards C two products, and metallic copper has more shown to be active towards methane, and this was something that we was not our target product. Uh, now the the reports are quite diverse, so there are metallic copper that is uh, producing ethylene and vice versa. So it's it's not real clear what what is the decipher parameter. So it would make now sense still to go back again to metallic copper and investigate this. But so far we have more focused on these oxides material, just based on the literature so far, actually. Great. Thank you, Simon. Um, another question um, was, was uh, I believe, uh, towards both. Um, could you specify the rare materials that you want to avoid in the lotter technology? Uh, we, yeah, we, we want to avoid, uh, uh, let's say, critical raw materials like precious metal electrocatalysts, like iridium, ruthenium oxide, of course. Using iridium and ruthenium oxide, we have a strong announcement of the oxygen evolution reaction, but uh, uh, you know there is no much availability of these materials, and uh, of course, there is. Uh, we need to decrease the capital costs for this technology for sure. And uh, we also wanted to uh, exclude materials that are in the critical uh, raw materials list for, from the European Commission, like cobalt and like rare earth elements. So. Uh, uh, this should be avoided because, of course, uh, there is not only a problem of cost, but also availability. Uh, we uh, are depending on other countries, on the supply of materials from other countries. And I think the new, uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, 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 the new efforts from the European Commission are to uh, be politically independent in terms of energy, in terms of materials, and so on. Thank you, Antonino. Um, so we are coming to the end of the uh, Lotacom session. And um, if uh, you do have any further questions, uh, which we did not uh, cover in this uh, Q&A session. Uh, I would uh, like to ask you to send us the question with your um, email address uh, so that we can come back to you personally. Uh, but for now, I would like to thank Simon and Antonino for uh, your presentations and for the insights into the catalyst world of the CO2 reduction and uh, water oxidation. And uh, we will be taking a break for half an hour and we'll be back at um, two o'clock. I see right now there are some more questions coming in, but uh, please uh, feel free to um, put your um, personal uh, details so that we can come back to you. Um, so thanks a lot. So, and switch in again at um, two o'clock to the ocean session, where we are going to have a presentation um, from, um, from uh, the ocean projects uh, in, with regard to the electrosynthesis and properties and development of the demonstrator unit pulled by Lecenti and Arno Mold. So I hope to see you in half an hour. Thanks a lot. <laughs>